Welcome to Lifespan News, your source for longevity science updates. I'm your host, Brett Nally. If you missed our last episode, then you can watch it by clicking the card above. We encourage you to check the description below for links to these stories. For our first story, UT Health San Antonio received a $2 million grant, which will enable a double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial to further study the effects of rapamycin on humans. The grant was announced on August 25, 2020, and is from Part the Cloud, the Gates Foundation, and the Alzheimer's Association. Bill Gates' father is currently suffering from Alzheimer's, so it's understandable that Bill Gates is very passionate about finding a cure for Alzheimer's. 40 individuals with mild cognitive impairment or early Alzheimer's disease will participate in this trial. Half of the patients in this trial will receive a daily dose of oral rapamycin, while the other half will receive a placebo. Patients will undergo a regular battery of brain health assessments at the Glenn Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases, an institute of UT Health San Antonio. Rapamycin has been extensively studied since the 2000s by the UT Health San Antonio Sam and Ann Barship Institute for Longevity and Aging Studies. Rapamycin gained U.S. Food and Drug Administration approval in 1999 for use in organ transplant recipients and improved memory function in mice that mimic Alzheimer's disease, a Barship Institute study found. The current study is considered an early phase two trial. Dr. Mitzi Gonzalez, study co-principal investigator stated, quote, the most important aim is to make sure that people can take rapamycin for 12 months and tolerate it safely. If it shows safety and benefit, we may take it to a larger trial." End quote. For our next story, a collective of scientists has shown that osteoarthritis can be alleviated by guiding skeletal stem cells, or mesenchymal stem cells, towards differentiation into chondrocytes, which are responsible for producing healthy cartilage. The term skeletal stem cells is relatively new, or rather reintroduced, and it requires a bit of explanation. Until recently, it was thought that stem cells that differentiate into bone and cartilage can be found not only in bone marrow, but in other tissues as well, such as muscle and fat. These cells were named mesenchymal stem cells, and the term is still widely used in the literature. However, more recent studies demonstrate that stem cells that differentiate into bone and cartilage exist exclusively in bone marrow, which is why some researchers insist that the term skeletal stem cells is more descriptive of the cell's localization. Since the 1950s, one of the most popular osteoarthritis treatments has been microfracture therapy, in which a minuscule injury is inflicted into the joint region, triggering tissue regeneration. The researchers set out to further elucidate the role that skeletal stem cells play in the regeneration of cartilage following microfracture therapy. Microfracture therapy increased the proliferation of the local skeletal stem cells population at the osteoarthritis affected joint. The transcriptional activity of genes in skeletal stem cells following microfracture therapy was also altered and became more reminiscent of the skeletal stem cells of young mice. Microfracture therapy reverted skeletal stem cells to a more juvenile type of gene expression, while also stimulating expansion of the skeletal stem cells population was substantially slower in aged animals, which led to reduced cartilage regeneration. However, when microfracture therapy activated skeletal stem cells from young mice were transplanted to older mice undergoing microfracture therapy BMP2-VEGF therapy, they greatly contributed to stable cartilage formation. By combining novel methods with this almost 70-year-old therapy, the researchers were able to overcome its limitations. This intervention resulted in the formation of healthy cartilage at osteoarthritis-affected sites. This achievement is hope-inspiring, given that osteoarthritis is a huge problem that affects about half the world's population over age 65. Moving on, a gene therapy treatment can ameliorate the loss of motor function and muscle strength in old mice. This offers hope to elderly people to continue an active lifestyle. The decline in motor function as we age is at least in part due to changes in neuromuscular junctions, the synapses that connect nerves to muscles. The DOK7 gene is required for normal development of neuromuscular junctions. Mutation of DOK7 causes a neuromuscular disease. Researchers use a recombinant muscle tropic adeno-associated virus, or AAV, as a vector to deliver a wild-type version of the human DOK7 gene to aged male mice. The team injected the mice with the DOK7 therapy vector, AAV-D7, when they were 24 months old and carried out tests four months later. 
They found that AAVD7 treatment enlarged the neuromuscular junctions of the mice and suppressed denervation. In fact, they report that the treated 28-month-old mice had lower levels of denervation compared to the untreated 24-month-old mice. This suggests that AAV-D7 not only prevents denervation, but also promotes re-innervation. This is exciting work, and it's wonderful to imagine that with a single injection, we could avoid the motor problems we associate with growing old. That said, gene therapies have a mixed track record, so long-term safety trials would be crucial, and before that, researchers need to show that the treatment works in human cells. The paper notes that there are only a handful of studies reporting the effects of age on neuromuscular junctions in humans, and their results aren't even entirely consistent. Therefore, the first step towards an eventful therapy for people must be to better understand how human neuromuscular junctions change with age. For our next story, a new review takes a look at the association between the decline of the immune system and the development and course of age-related diseases. As we get older, the immune system as a whole begins to break down and fail in a process known as immunosenescence. Immunosenescence is also accompanied by insidious inflammation. Persistent systemic inflammation is often called inflammaging, and immunosenescence is only one of the sources, but it is a significant one. In this study, the researchers explore how the aging immune system contributes to the development of age-related diseases, such as neurodegenerative disease, rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, cardiovascular, and metabolic diseases. Given the range of age-related diseases, as well as the increased risk from infections and the reduction of tissue repair, the rejuvenation of the immune system should be a top priority. Thankfully, there are a number of initiatives seeking to achieve just that including Intervene Immune's efforts to regenerate the thymus. Solving the problem of immunosenescence would almost certainly be a huge step towards longer, healthier lives free from the diseases of aging. For our final story, an open access paper on nature communication suggests that senolytic drugs may be a potential approach to improve the odds of successful transplant of aged organs. Organs of older deceased people are often considered ineligible for transplantation because they are more likely to be rejected by the recipient's body and pose higher risk of other adverse outcomes. The study found that organs from older donors are more ridden with senescent cells. These organs also presented high levels of cell-free mitochondrial DNA, that is, mitochondrial DNA that is excreted by cells due to the action of stressors. Senescent cells do this too. According to the paper, cell-free mitochondrial DNA accumulates with aging and contributes to inflammation, that is, age-related chronic inflammation. In mice, the researchers observed that administering senolytics resulted in the clearing of senescent cells and a decrease in cell-free mitochondrial DNA, as well as diminished inflammation. Tissue transplanted from older mice that were previously treated with senolytics survived for longer in the mice that received the transplant. The researchers therefore conclude that senolytic treatment may be an avenue to transplant older organs and reduce organ shortages. That's all the news for this video. Remember, there's a few free, quick, and simple things that you can do to help support us on our mission. If you haven't already yet, make sure you like this video, share this video on your social media, let us know what you think in the comments below, and also, if you haven't already yet, make sure that you're subscribed and click that notification bell to select all notifications. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you in the next video, at least as healthy as you are now.